How did the Maya write, and what were they writing about? These questions have intrigued generations of professional scholarship and popular culture, each world painting its own picture of ancient Maya life and how it was recorded into mysterious glyphs. Hello! This episode in the Native American Writing Systems playlist will explore the hieroglyphic writing of the ancient Maya. Learning how the glyphs were originally deciphered will lead into explaining how they transcribed Mayan language into enduring images. Notice that I have already mentioned both Maya and Mayan so far. I am following the convention for using Maya when we look at their society and culture, and then Mayan with the final n on matters of language. I extend this rule to include writing and literature, so you will hear me speak of Mayan glyphs written at Maya cities. By illustrating how glyphs represented grammar, this video will then translate a few real examples from the ancient world. This episode will give special attention to glyphs from the city of Copan at the west end of modern Honduras. Sitting at the eastern frontier of Maya land, Copan created an exceptional body of texts for not only its number but also the extravagance of the glyphs themselves. The Maya civilization has a unique place in the history of Native American writing because their glyphic tradition exploded, especially when compared to relatively confined regions of earlier civilizations from the previous episode the Olmec of the southern Gulf of Mexico, and the Zapotec of central Oaxaca. The Maya, on the other hand, composed thousands of glyphic texts from over a thousand years of history and across a massive area of land. At least 85% of all these texts can now be translated. Although the earliest Mayan-style glyphs appeared by the 3rd century BC, most of the glyphic texts date between 250 and 900 AD the span of what archaeologists call the Classic Period in Mesoamerica. And indeed, they even used the discontinuation of calendar glyphs on monumental art to mark the beginning of the post-Classic Period, shortly after the year 900. The Maya thus provide an unparalleled view into their beliefs and practices from their own words. We must be cautious, however, about making our statements of Maya culture too general. Practically all our surviving texts come from tombs, monuments, vases, and other such elite contexts. The values and knowledge among the ruling classes probably didn't match those of their commoner subjects, living off the land in more remote settings. The practice of writing itself had high status. Evidence suggests that the scribal profession was hereditary and it required intensive schooling. Because writing was dedicated to royal affairs, the scribes themselves belonged to the court. They could enjoy luxuries in both life and death, such as the wealth found in scribe burials at Copan. Writing even had mythic quality. The word for writing was tzip, which additionally related to painting. The most famous scribes in Maya myth were the monkey twins in the Kiche epic Po Po Wu, which portrayed them as master artists and scribes. The myth also spoke of the magical powers of possessing writing, such as the psychic abilities of Lord Kukumatz, who owned a book of the council mat, or Bo Bo Wu. The Maya deemed writing an instrument of royal and spiritual power. Michael Coe's seminal work on the history of Mayan decipherment pointed out that for generations, scholars were debating whether the glyphs represented specific ideas of Maya thought or specific sounds in Mayan language. The previous episode in the Writing Systems playlist introduced logographic script, notably as it pertained to Zapotec writing. A logographic system has hundreds to thousands of characters representing distinct concepts, units of meaning, which the last episode identified as the morphemes of language. In many cases, Mayan glyphs do identify numbers, days, actions, and even cities. These glyphs therefore follow the logographic system, for they specify units of meaning in a Mayan language. But is this all they do, or could Maya writing also describe the sounds of their tongue? In the early 1860s, Abbot Brasur de Borborg found the only known copy of the 1566 Report on the Things of Yucatan, a colonial manuscript by Friar Diego de Landa. This milestone discovery would help establish two fundamental principles in the translation of Mayan glyphs, like those listed in the last episode for reading Zapotec. One, the characters could encode sounds from a specific grammar. Two, the specific grammar encoded in these characters is Mayan, related to the languages still spoken among descendants in the area. 
You may remember a previous episode in the Writing Systems playlist on Diego de Landa's infamous destruction of Maya codices in Yucatan. After the conquest, many Spanish clergy were writing down details of native languages and cultures to better understand their thinking, to convert them more easily, so went the belief. Look at the list of characters toward the bottom of this page. Landa was telling the Yucatec Maya to produce the characters matching each letter in the Spanish alphabet because he assumed that the Maya were also writing with their own alphabet. The text even gives a short sample sentence. ma in ka ti I don't want to. This short passage was a vital step toward cracking the Maya code because it illustrated, by first-hand account, matches between glyphs and sounds from a Mayan language. By that same logic, the glyphs written in ancient times must also represent the grammar of a Mayan language. It wasn't until the 1950s that Russian scholar Yuri Norozov tested this hypothesis with glyphs such as those found in the Dresden Codex. One of the most famous cases involved a set of moon goddess images from the Dresden Codex. Each image in the series presents the goddess with a companion bird, a set of glyphs above. Norozov noticed that some of these glyphs looked like signs from Landa's so-called alphabet. Given that the Dresden Codex and Landa's report were both from Yucatan, Norozov suspected that the glyphs in this passage could be naming the birds in view. One of these is the Quetzal, a precious bird for its elegant plumage. Many Mayan languages name it Kuk. Norozov found the Ku sign written back to back toward the top. This suggested that the Maya were combining these signs by their respective sounds to form words. The U glyph, also in Landa's alphabet, is a common prefix in Mayan languages for marking possession. It precedes a stylized glyph for the so-called Muwan bird, one of the month names, and the final character stood for T. Altogether, the glyphs read Kuk Umut, the Quetzal is her bird indicating a mythical relation between the Quetzal and this part of the lunar cycle. Another bird in this series is the macaw, Mo'o. This time, Nodosov knew only the O value from the Landa diagram. It also appeared back to back, immediately following an unknown character. If the values would be read together as O, and the common Mayan name for the macaw was Mo'o, then this first character had to stand for Mo. The full name could thus be read as Mo'o. As Norozov continued piecing together these signs, he could begin to read out phrases that made sense in the Mayan languages. One last example depicts a vivid dog whose name appeared in the glyphs for Tzu and Lu, combined to read Tzul. Again, this word could be corroborated with linguistic studies, for it appears in a colonial dictionary of Yucatec Mayan. The evidence was building for reading the glyphs with a knowledge of the Mayan languages of past and present. In fact, the consensus is that all the texts composed in Maya land represented a single language varying by only regional dialects. Linguists called the language Classic Mayan, and it was an administrative language used for stately affairs with kings, priests, and other officials across the Maya region. Classic Mayan was therefore a lingua franca, it belongs to the Eastern Cholan branch of the Mayan language group, with related languages spoken in the border region between Southeast Guatemala and Northwest Honduras. See if you can figure out what kinds of sounds these Mayan characters represent, and you may pause here to take your time. Each character specifies a consonant-vowel combination, which can form syllables. This chart is therefore a syllabary, representing different sound groups with similar patterns of consonants and vowels. The signs from Landa's alphabet were also syllables, reflecting what the Maya thought Landa was asking for when he was listing letters in Spanish such as A, B, and Q. You may have noticed that some of the consonants appear twice but with an apostrophe. See, for example, the CH and CH rows, and the K and K rows. These are examples of glottalized consonants, which you pronounce with a forceful stop. Many Mayan languages distinguish between regular and glottalized consonants. In classic Mayan, teach meant word or reason, and teach meant blood. Also, kab meant bee or honey, and kab meant hand. Several of these syllables even follow the rebus principle, which I introduced in a previous episode in this writing systems playlist. 
It was defined as the representation of sounds by combining their corresponding images. Examples of the Rebus principle in this chart include ba for gopher, mo for macaw, and tsu for backbone. How could the mo sign represent a macaw? It's the I. The Maya could combine these to form full words. An interesting note to raise here is that the classic Mayan language had a phonological rule for forming words, in that they could never begin or end with a vowel, only consonants. So how did they apply that rule to these signs? Does the first row at upper left really stand for syllables with just a vowel? Actually, there is an understood glottal stop, pronounced uh, with a burst from the windpipe, which counts as a consonant to precede each vowel. A, E, I, O, U. And for the last consonant in a word, use the syllable sign and drop the vowel. We will see examples in this video and the next. A Mayan glyph may use one or many parts. When it has multiple, there is usually one main element, the largest in the block as its base. Its affix elements may be attached to any side to specify a sound before or after the main part. When a single glyph has multiple pieces, each contributes to the overall reading. The Mayan script is therefore logosyllabic because it combines signs for elements of specific meanings and elements for specific sound groups. The syllable signs can also help with reading the main glyph. The month Yashkin has a glyph that contains a solid boundary around a central X in the shape of a shield. Beneath it is a sign for the syllable ni, used here to remind the reader that this part of the word ends with n. The syllable isn't adding any new sound to the phrase, but rather reinforcing how to properly pronounce it. These can appear at either the beginning or the end of a word. Linguists call this a phonetic complement because it helps clarify the intended pronunciation, and therefore the intended meaning. Phonetic complements have appeared in logographic systems in other parts of the world, such as Sumerian cuneiform and Japanese okurigana. A convention for transcribing characters into Roman letters is to write logographic symbols, those which convey the language's morpheme elements of meaning, with capital letters. Syllables and other phonetic markers, which represent the sounds in a language, are written in lowercase. The site of Copan is celebrated for its extraordinary creativity with glyphic writing. This example is from a steely monument, which the Maya inscribed on at least one surface to commemorate important religious or political events. This one is Copan Steely A, and the original is at the Sculpture Museum by the archaeological site. Glyphs run down its sides and back. They describe how the current king performed rites reenacting mythic events that would culminate with a deposit of ritual artifacts in front of the stele. It was dedicated in the year 731 AD. The renowned scholar Linda Sheely sketched the glyphs on the back surface, which has helped preserve their original clarity for future reference. The Los Angeles County Museum of Art has gracefully granted permission to display her illustration of Copan Stele A. A full reconstruction now appears where the original stood, in the city's great plaza. Here we will see how one glyph could express an entire phrase, in this case the name of a supernatural being. We will also follow the conventions I gave for transcribing the elements into Roman letters. The first element is the U prefix, the first of the three U syllable signs listed in the chart. As we saw with the Macaw translation, the U prefix marks possession. Because it is a syllable sign indicating sounds, we make it lowercase, and we show its phonetic attachment to the glyph with a hyphen. Next is the morpheme for Bach, meaning image or likeness. This is another rebus example as it uses the image for gopher, ba, to represent the word Bach. This glyph is representing a full unit of meaning, in this case the concept of an image, so it is a morpheme in the classic Mayan language. We therefore convey it in capital letters. Beneath it is a glyph for he, which reminds us to pronounce bach with the aspirated ch at the end. It is a phonetic complement, like the one we just had for the yashkin glyph. The reading so far? The image of. Whose? Let's finish reading. The phrase continues above, to the right. A double flame often means fire, kach, which is a morpheme. This character is thus logographic, not syllabic, and so we put it in caps. 
The next two glyphs are also logographic because they describe units of meaning. Kinich for great sun, and then Chan for serpent. Notice that we connect these parts with periods instead of hyphens. Periods tell anthropologists to read the parts together as units of meaning, and hyphens for units of sound. One more hyphen attaches Chan to its phonetic complement, the Na syllable. You can also find this sign in the syllable chart. This entire glyph reads, Ubach Kach Kinich Chan, the image of the fiery sun shield serpent, referring to a mythic being that the king impersonated during a ritual celebrating the turning of a major calendar cycle. Which king did this? Below we see the glyph with his name, Washak Lahun Ubach Kawil, 18 images of the lightning god, 13th king of the Kopan dynasty. Maya scribes usually compose glyphs into pairs to read left to right, then downward. Most of the stelae monuments at Copan followed this pattern. Other media, such as ceramics and codices, used this reading convention as well. Other texts were written in a circle, especially for ceramics such as vases and plates. Using the rules introduced in this episode, the next one will translate a Mayan text from one of these plates. Join us for the following installment.